here. And I'm going to be going over the big 11 game main slate we have here on uh, Saturday, June 10. Um, early start here, 1 o'clock Eastern for the early game, uh, Arizona and Detroit. And then kind of trickle in four more games kind of in the early window. Nice little six game afternoon slate. Um, that does not include the Coors game, so you can get a little bit more spread out and you don't have to worry about having to eat a crap load of ownership on everybody at Coors here. So um, starting to get lineups to roll in here a few hours before lock, uh, so let's, um, let's get into it. We do have projections loaded to the site. We'll also have, with a larger uh, six-game afternoon here, we'll push afternoon slate projections, um, including ownership and, and all that jazz to the site. And for those that have the Saverson package, um, we will, they, those will auto populate there as well. So, um, we're pretty spread out here today with everybody on the mound up top and similar to yesterday, I think we can make some decisions and make some pivots here. We don't have to just click in 30% Sandy Alcantara. We'll talk about a little bit of his vulnerability this season. Um, we don't have to come in, come down here and auto click in an 8,100 miles Michaelis. Um, you know, we can spread out a little bit here because a lot of these guys are for the most part projecting in pretty much the same range. And that allows us to, you know, it's a big slate here uh, that allows us to get different on the mound. And then we can go and play some of the more obvious spots with our offenses, right? Of course, we have uh, we have San Diego in Coors Field again. Um, and, I mean, that's clear, pretty much far and away the uh, the most popular spot now. We're, we're going to want to get to a little bit of that. So uh, we're going to have to spread out on the mound. And I think that's um, that's playable. A couple guys here, like, egregiously overpriced. Um, others are uh, maybe not so much. So let's uh, let's just get into it and try and keep it a little bit condensed here and go through things um, as quickly as possible. Game one here, Arizona and the Tigers. I think uh, both offenses here are in play. They got Ryan Nelson going on the mound uh, for the D-backs. He's 5,400. This is an intriguing price tag, right? This is the Tigers on the other side. They're bad. Um, however, they did just get... Here, we've got uh, lineups for both of these teams rolling in so far. They did just get Kerry Carpenter back, and sure enough, he's back in the three-hole. Um, very big hit tool from the left side of the plate here for Carp. Um, and you know, you've also got a Zach McKinstry at the top of the lineup, 3700 Very serviceable price tag for him. Javi Baez, he's been horrific all season. He's got it, it, like an X-ISO of like 080 or something like that. Um, still striking out a lot and not making a whole hell of a lot of contact is bias. So that makes him a little bit hard to play. Um, but Carp and Nick Maton, who makes a good bit of hard contact against right-handers, is very much in play. He has he struggles with some off-speed stuff as still a, a pretty young hitter. But now that they've got Kerry Carpenter back and healthy... That gives them at least three lefties that you could make a little mini stack with. Uh, it's still hard to get to full stacks with the Tigers on full 11 game slates uh, because they're a bad offense, right? Um, it was just a 78 WRC plus and an aggregate 24% strikeout rate. So uh, now, can you mix in a Tor? Can you mix in a Zach Short or or a Javi Baez as well? Well, yeah, they're playable price tags, right? Um, if you need to get to a very expensive offense with a totally unowned offense like the Tigers, I think that puts them in play because Ryan Nelson pitches to so much contact. 84% here. He doesn't throw past anybody. 14% strikeout rate. Every other metric is is mostly pretty okay, given that he pitches to so much contact. Um, the changeup is bad because the four-seamer is not all that great. He's got a serviceable arsenal that will allow him to survive because he's got four pitches here. None of them are really any good, so we're not going to wow anybody with CSW here. 22.5% CSW, that's uh, not great, to say the least. 67% strand rate, you can probably expect this to tick up a little bit, um, but he's mostly going to be in the you know 4.5 to 5 
ERA range um, until he can develop some swing and miss. So without a lot of swing and miss, even at 5,400, even against the Tigers, I find it pretty difficult. I don't think you're going to need to get all the way down here today because, frankly, the guys above 10,000 are in, are all in really difficult matchups. Like Nola gets the Dodgers, no thank you. Uh, Nathan Eovaldi gets Tampa, also kind of no thank you. And then you get uh, Joe Ryan at 10-6, who we'll get to. He gets Toronto, you know, so kind of difficult. Um, you might not need to get all the way up on the mound to something that expensive. If you do it with two different offenses, then yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it puts him in play because he's very cheap and he has five and a third and even six innings in this particular matchup because the Tigers are still going to strike out. Um, you know, there's a, a couple standard deviations worth of variance here for Ryan Nelson. It's in the tank. However, if I got to choose here, I'm, I'm going to side with the Tigers offense, play Zach McKinstry, play a Kerry Carpenter, play a Nick Maton. And just kind of close my eyes. On the other side, Matt Boyd on the mound for the Tigers. Uh, 6,800 for him. Um, he's basically just an average arm anymore. Uh, t- average strikeout rate, 23%. Slightly elevated walk rate here at 10%. Barrel rate's good. We like that. He's throw strike one. And he's got decent chase and, and decent swinging strikes. So that allows him to survive as well. Um, however, this is a pretty difficult matchup against Arizona. And it He's just an average arm that's got a little bit of susceptibility still to right-handed hitters. Now, the numbers this season are actually pretty damn good because the changeup's been much better for him than it has been in the past. But overall, he is similar to Ryan Nelson in that the arsenal, pretty spread out. He's got one more pitch, which is good. But for the most part, the um, each one of these pitches is not all that equitable, right? Not too outsized to the rest of the league. So uh, not going to wow you here with stuff either. And really, I think it puts him in play mostly because of the price tag and the ownership here. Uh, but I really don't want to go after Arizona. I think he's a very dangerous team against right-handed pitching and, or excuse me, against left-handed pitching with a lot of their righties. Yeah, Corbin Carroll hit two dingers yesterday. Cattell Marte hits from both sides, of course. Lord Escuriel is back. He's at 4,300. Um, he's had a little bit of time off. But uh, you know, we'll see if he'll be able to continue his kind of homer, homer barrage that he was on before he took a seat. And Christian Walker, 4,000, very playable piece here. Manny Rivera sees lefties very well, of course. So uh, if you want to play Nick Ahmed down at the bottom of the line, he's a very cheap shortstop piece. Um, he's always hit lefties very well. They platoon him a good bit. And... A uh, Gabby Marino behind the plate is an okay catcher piece if you want to get there. Um, so I'm not super thrilled about playing Arizona here today, but I do like a short stack. Um, you know, Cattell Marte at 4,900 is a little stiff, I think. But uh, what I think we could hopefully expect for Matt Boyer, hopefully look forward to, is a little bit of strand rate regression also and see his suppression metrics uh, fall a little bit more in line with his expecteds. Uh, about a run delta here, give or take. Good ground ball stuff to the left side still, so we don't really want any of the lefties. I'd stick with mostly the righties if I'm getting to Arizona, but for the most part, I'm kind of lukewarm on this game. Um, I don't really want to play Matt Boyd because I respect Arizona's offense, but I respect Matt Boyd enough that I don't really want to be uh, clicking in a ton of Arizona here. Um, but I do like Lord S and I do like Christian Walker. Of course, this is a big ballpark over in Comerica. However, it's a day game. Baseball will travel a little bit better, um, and it's 80 degrees there. So I think it's fine. Price tag-wise, both of these arms are in play, but they they pitch to a, a bit too much contact. Certainly Ryan Nelson does for my liking. Um, you know, if I got to choose, of course I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Matt Boyd. But uh, I really don't like attacking Arizona for the most part. They don't strike out a lot, just a 21.5% aggregate K rate, and they're sneaky good. They'll hit a lot of ground balls, and with their righties over here, that's a a pretty decent batted ball matchup. So it takes me off of Boyd a little bit. I think this is kind of a fishy price tag uh, given this particular matchup. Wish he were a little bit cheaper, and then I would be kind of comfortable, more comfortable clicking it in. Okay, let's move on to Miami and the White Sox. Uh, we got Sandy Alcantara on the mound. He's garnering a lot of ownership here so far. He's 9,500, but man, Sandy has been really struggling to find it this season. Um... He's still a horse, right? He's still throwing 95 and 100 pitches a start. He's still going super deep into games. He's very efficient. 
when there's nobody on base, right? I, so I don't know what the deal is here. The strikeout stuff is totally evaporated. This is down about four ticks from where it was last, three and four ticks from where it was last year when he won the Cy Young. Most of it is coming on the lack of good changeup and slider value. He's not getting any swing and miss on either of these two pitches. And as we can see, that's translating to just a 22.5% to the lefties, when historically his changeup has been pretty damn good. And same thing with the right side, 19.5% K right there. Slider has always been pretty damn good too. He's still establishing enough with the two-seamer and the four-seamer mixture here Throwing a hell of a lot of strike one. Look at this chase rate still, 35%. Swing strikes are at 13%. All very encouraging. He stays off the barrel. Still getting ground balls, heavy ground balls to the right side of the plate and not giving up any hard contact or production there at all. It's just the lack of swing and miss that's really prevented Sandy from popping for a lot of huge DFS scores. He's only popped for more than 20 points twice this season in a full 12 starts. I mean, do we really want to be clicking in a 9,500 guy at 30% ownership with that? I don't know. He's really struggling. Uh, we've watched him pitch a lot this year because I've, I've loved Sandy for a really long time. Um, and unfortunately, he's really struggling to find it. With the changeup in particular, in particular, um, everything else though we're looking for a lot of po positive regression to come as soon as I think it's mechanical that you know something when he gets out of the windup and into the stretch when there's runners on, um, who knows he may be tipping pitches there. Uh, I think you know Miami's really going to have to dig into what's going on with Sandy. Um, but he's still going deep enough into games. It makes him serviceable enough. This is kind of a difficult strikeout matchup. And as I mentioned, the strikeout stuff is totally evaporated. It's gone. Now, if we're looking for some positive regression, um, the plate discipline numbers are elite outside of the raw K rate. The strand rate here, 58%. This is insanely low. So we're looking for a full run of regression positive to come for Sandy at some point. Still not pitching to a lot of contact. You know, the, the neutral ground ball to fly ball against lefties is, is p fine. You know, there's hard contact there, yeah. And that's a little bit of worry for Sandy. And, you know, he needs to figure out what's going on with this changeup here. You know, the velo is still there. That's not a problem. Maybe down a tick from last year, but, like, whatever. So it could be, like, a baseball problem in that, you know, the change in the baseball that has reduced drag and, you know, MLB is trying to encourage more offense this season with all the rule changes. That, well, they also changed the baseball. Um, and we've seen a lot of uh, depression in some historically higher strikeout rates, notably for a guy that threw yesterday in Christian Javier. His strikeout rate is down nine ticks, nine percentage points in aggregate to everybody last season. Same thing with Sandy. So these are historical high strikeout arms that are really trying to find it um, and, and struggling quite a bit. So that kind of takes me off at a full 30% ownership. I love Sandy, and I'm going to have some, but I'm probably not going to have this much. This price tag, I think, is a little fishy. In the 9K range, I think I'd rather go to the other side, to be honest, and play Michael Kopech. Um, he's trending in a different direction. Now, his underlying metrics are pretty noisy. We got a lot of negative regression, I think, coming for Michael Kopech in terms of the strand rate. He's got an 82% strand rate, and we ranted about this for a good bit yesterday. This number is not sustainable. There's two starting pitchers in baseball over the last 40 years that have been able to sustain anything anywhere close to this. And those guys are Jacob deGrom and Clayton Kershaw over very large samples. And they're still two and a half percentage points lower than this. It's 79%. Yet anything north of 80 for anybody it is just not sustainable. Um, you know, we don't have any baseball data suggesting that guys can sustain this over very large samples. So this is going to tick down. Um, and as we see, we've got some, I mean, he's mostly right in line with his expected metrics in terms of suppression, but he's got a, a batting average allowed sub 200 buck 18 whip, given that he's got an 11% walk rate. Um, I think we got some shenanigans. Now, four of his last five starts have been really, really good. He's trending in a different direction. And just because I would prefer him to Sandy here at a cheaper price tag does not necessarily mean I want to click in Michael Kopech either. Um, now, we did see that Miami is a pretty poor offense, right? Even Dylan Cease's 
ridiculous mechanics. He survived um, yesterday, right? And he still struck out a good few guys, and that, that puts Michael Kopech in play. Um, however, they're still kind of difficult to get to, or get through, rather, with Luis Arise hitting over 400 still at the top of the lineup. Um, overall, I'd side with Kopech as opposed to the Marlins and opposed to Sandy Alcantara. He's cheaper, number one. I like the ownership far better, of course. And really, we're only getting, you know, two points worth of projection delta. Two points is not nothing, don't get me wrong. Um, but for the most part, the value score here, given the price delta at $400, $400 is not nothing either. Um, and if we want to get to some expensive offenses, then, you know, we might need this 400 So given the, the value score here, they're not all that much different either. So um, I think I'd prefer Kopech. I'm kind of lukewarm on the game for the most part. I really don't want to play offense here because I respect both of these arms quite a bit. Um, Michael Kopech, like I said, his strikeout stuff recently has been elite and that's where I would mostly prefer him as opposed to Alcantara because if Kopech does give up some runs due to the walk rate and the egregiously high barrel rate at 16%, this is, this is insane, way too high. This takes me off of him because this number is out of control bad. Um, he, he does still have the whiff stuff, right? At 27.5%. He if he does give up a little bit of production to Miami, he has strikeout stuff that he can earn that back with in just one at bat. And Sandy, he's just not displaying that he still has it. Um, he'll pop every now and again for a very high strikeout game, uh, but it's more likely that Kopech does it, right? So these offenses really, I mean, I don't see a whole hell of a lot of difference here. 22.5% aggregate K rates, low and below average walk rates, 82 WRC plus for the White Sox, 91 WRC plus for the Marlins. So this puts pitching more in play for me. I don't want to play these guys, uh, these offenses rather, but I I think the price tags are a little fishy here, uh, given some underlying metrics for Sandy in terms of the raw whiff stuff and a floor that he's really struggling to find it with a, a changeup. And for Kopech over here with a high walk rate, a lower strike one rate, and a ridiculously high barrel rate, 16.5%. So uh, if you want to take some shots and and look for some, some of these numbers to persist, uh, I think it's probably okay. Probably, uh, I mean, it's well down the list for me. I don't want to go after either of the of these arms because like I said I respect them quite quite a bit so mostly kind of a meh game for me um we'll see how I come in with it but I'll have some Kopech for sure and I'll have a little bit of Sandy I think because I'm not too thrilled with most of the pitching options that we've got today but um eh, I'm not too excited about it you know let's don't get me wrong okay let's move on to the Reds and the and the cards I want to go back to the Reds tonight or today um you know Jordan Montgomery made me look kind of dumb yesterday uh, Reds made me look mostly dumb. Um, I want to go back to it, though. I don't want to play Andrew Abbott, however. Uh, I think his price tag's probably a bit high, and we've only got the one start for him. Uh, he was good, right? Went six innings, didn't give up any production. But he had some walk problems, gave up some loud contact, and I don't want to be messing with that against Cardinals. We saw what they did to them yesterday, uh, to Bed Lively, that is. Um, even against a very serviceable six-pits arsenal that, that Lively's got, you know, all it really takes for the Cardinals here is to get a guy on and they start hitting the baseball over the wall, right? They, they hit three two-run homers last night off of Ben Lively, Arenado, um, who else was it? Jordan Walker, and uh, I forget who. Um, in any case, this is still a very potent offense over here for the Cardinals, and I think I'd rather get to some Arenado. He's a very play playable 5,100, kind of off the board a little bit here. And, I mean, we've played Arenado for years. He's had some of the best numbers against left-handers um, in, in baseball. Yeah, he played at Coors Field, but, like, whatever. Those numbers persisted when he was away from Coors as well. And in his first couple seasons in St. Louis, it's not like they changed all that much. Same thing with Paul Goldschmidt. Now, both of them have been... A little cooler to start the season the first two months of the season but it doesn't mean they're this isn't a, a plus matchup uh platoon wise for them so i'd like to get to some cardinals if i can but like i said i want to go after michaelis too i do not believe in any of this nonsense with michaelis he's got an 86 percent contact rate 
And he throws a lot of the, a lot of strikes. He doesn't walk people, and he for the most part stays off the barrel. But his ground ball stuff it's historically been very high. He's much more neutral now this season with this kind of contact rate. Um, I I don't believe in elevated price tags for this guy. Like he cannot throw it past anybody. Just at 19% strikeout rate. He's got two outings this season where he struck out 10. Um. It's wrong. That's on. Uh, that's Kopech. He's got one outing where he struck out ten. Uh, where is Michaelis over here? Um, and that was what two starts ago against Kansas City, who strikes out, you know, like against me. Um, but every other outing, he had one against the Cubs earlier in the year where he struck out seven. But he followed up his ten strikeout outing against Pittsburgh, where with by spraying ten hits and striking out two. Uh, and giving up two runs, you know. So he's incredibly variant here, and at higher ownership, I don't want to eat that um, at a very high contact rate. I want to go back to the Reds. I really respect the the young hitters here. There's going to be some growing pains for them, and good arms are going to be able to take them apart uh, like Jordan Montgomery did last night. But for the most part, I mean, I'm pretty short on Michaelis. Uh, I, I don't believe in the arsenal here. I don't like the slider. I don't like the curveball. I don't like the four-seamer. And he throws a lot of the two-seamer here. Changeup is okay, but he doesn't throw it all that much. Um, you know, I like that he throws strikes, but I don't like really how many th- strikes he throws without any raw whiff stuff. So, um, I mean, look at these line drive rates against Michaelis. 29% to the left side, 28% to... The righties, I mean, that's out of control, terrible, and super, super attackable. So give me some lefties here. Give me Jake Fraley at 4200 I love this price. Give me Ellie De La Cruz. He's got third base eligibility now, so you can finally play both he and Matt McClain. Um, give me him at 4000 I think he's still underpriced, to be quite honest. So you can play the entire top half of the lineup here. You want to play Will Benson? Yeah, go ahead. He's 2600 Um, I like some reds here, and I'm going to have some because I think the Cardinals are going to be markedly more popular. And I think there's upside here for, it's probably going to be short stacks. It'll keep me off of full stacks, but I mean, full stacks because are, are very much in play because Michael is, is so popular here. I think this is really, really fishy. Uh, he's probably going to make me look stupid too, but uh, I'm going to take the other side here and I want to get to uh, some reds and definitely some Cardinals as well. Uh, I think they've got more raw ISO power that I'm, um, I mean, they're, much more often get hit the baseball over the wall. So, yeah, give me that. And they're not going to be nearly as popular as some of the other teams who we'll get to uh, shortly. So, um, like offense, pretty pretty much exclusively in that game. Minnesota and Toronto here. Joe Ryan on the mound. This is the guy I'm going to play if I get above 10000 or when I get above 10000 on the mound. 10-6, I think the price tag is fine. He's been struggling a little bit in his last, uh, what, five starts. Um you know, four of his last five starts is, have not really been all that great. Eh, three, I guess. Um, but strikeout stuff is, is still kind of there. In his last three, he's had a couple of difficult strikeout matchups, Houston and Cleveland. And he had San Francisco, which is a good strikeout matchup, but they're a dangerous team. And he only struck out four, still went five innings. Just, really just didn't have his best stuff in that particular outing. Uh, got taken apart a little bit by Houston. And, again, just struck out four and six and two-thirds against Cleveland. Another difficult strikeout matchup here for Toronto. Sonny Gray was was fine last night. Um, you know, strikeout stuff was okay. He just didn't go all that deep into the game. He only went five innings. I'm more comfortable with Joe Ryan at you know an elevated price tag. Uh, again, in this matchup, it, I think this is a really good platoon matchup. Now they went, they had what four lefties in the list last night. They played t- uh, Tyler Heineman. Uh, behind the plate, he's a switch hitter, like, and it, he had a bunt single, you know, against, uh, against, um, uh, whoever was throwing for it, I just totally lost it, uh, Sonny Gray, um, for, for Toronto, it, like, um, you know, so they're probably still only gonna have three lefties in the lineup, um, Brandon Belt, Dalton Varsho, and probably Kevin Biggio, since they're still likely to be missing a Kevin Kiermaier. So very right-handed heavy is Toronto, and well, look at the numbers against righties for Joe Ryan this season: 211 average allowed, 251 woven, a buck 27 ISO, 34% K rate with a 4% walk rate. Sign me up for that 
as much as possible at half the ownership to, to a guy like Michaelis and depress line drive rates. So that's great. Where I do get a little bit concerned here is there's some slightly elevated hard contact at 32%. It's not worrisome or anything, but um, to the right side. And he's an 060 ground ball to fly ball guy to the righties. And Toronto, the right-handers, they um, they hit a lot of ground balls. Or, you know, they're buck 20 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate, buck 15 or so. And 21% line drive rate here with a 34% hard contact rate against right-handers. So um, that can line up pretty decently for Toronto, and that's what would make me balk a little bit at a 10-6 price tag for Joe Ryan. But everything else is fantastic. Uh, what I'm really attracted to is the walk rate and the minuscule barrel rate here at 3%. Even for a fly ball pitcher, um, like you need to guys to stay off of the barrel with high swinging strike rates. He's super, super efficient because the four-seamer is elite here. One of the best four-seamers for starting pitcher in baseball. Chase rate is 40%. It's so, so good. We need a little bit more in the call strike department out of him. Uh, we mentioned this a couple of times. That'll pop him north of 30 in the CSW, but it's okay if he could develop this slider out a little bit more, uh, this sweeper pitch that he's, he's kind of working with. Um, that'll give him more swing and miss, and he'll be able to even throw this to lefties a little bit and generate some more swing and miss. But this this split change here is so, so good. Look at the power numbers, power suppression numbers to the lefties, 083 ISO. Um, needs a little bit more swing and miss to them. Maybe add in a cutter to get some more soft contact from the lefties, but for the most part, everything fundamentally is great, and and I want to play Joe Ryan above 10,000. He's the guy I'm going to get to. Um, Toronto, we don't really have a starter here announced officially for them yet. Um, by most accounts around the industry, it's going to be Bowden Francis. He is, he made his debut like last season, I believe, for Toronto, but he came out of the bullpen through a third of an inning and then went right back to AAA. So he's been in AAA for the last three seasons, um, kind of honing his craft. And this season is really kind of breaking out, to be quite honest. I don't have any of the numbers in the sheet here, but in – a, sh a very short sample so far uh, in AAA this year. He may have been hurt earlier. Um, he's only got, what, 15 and two-thirds in uh, in AAA this year. But he's got, you know, it, it pretty elite suppression figures. 35% K rate with a 6% walk rate, 17% swinging strike rate. And unfortunately, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball with a, a, a slight fly ball lean here. Um, when the baseball is getting in the air, it's kind of going over the wall. But for the most part, that's not happening all that often. He's, he, with, with just a, a short sample here, we're getting a lot of noise there. So don't think we're going to see quite as high uh, a swing strike rate as 17% really persist in the big leagues if he is to stay up here. Uh, he's vacating or um, he is... You know, occupying here the the vacated spot by Alec Manoa, um, who they had to you know get rid of to try and get right. So I, I think at five thousand here, I think this is in play. The Twins are a pretty bad offense to be quite honest. Um, they're on the downside of yeah, you know, they're similar to like Arizona, right? They're going to create at an average clip, but for the most part, these are they're far more attackable because they strike out at a, you know five ticks higher or five ticks more than Arizona. Um, for instance, so 32% hard contact, neutral ground ball to fly ball. They're popping up a lot of balls here, full 10.5%. Buck 70 ISO, it's like, okay, they've got some lefties here that they can go after Francis with, and he's going to give up some fly balls, right? Um, the 080 and neutral ground ball to fly ball to both sides of the plate. That will almost certainly be the case against lefties. Unfortunately, we don't have um, very equitable splits for minor league guys so um you know at least from the, the sources that i'm gathering from to put in the sheets in any case uh i think that puts him in play here at uh at, at five thousand flat uh i know the projection's low but we this is a pretty solid number actually across the industry most everybody has him projected um so it looks like he's probably officially been announced from a lot of the beat writers just not necessarily from the team they've had to uh, move some guys around uh, on the active roster. 
um, you know, to bring him up officially. So they just haven't quite done it yet. They'll do it here in the next, you know, couple hours for lock. Um, but I think both pitchers are here in are in play here. And if you want to play some Toronto, uh, or excuse me, some Minnesota against Bowden Francis, I think that's okay. You can go after a young arm here uh, with a major league lineup. We saw, for example, Oakland yesterday. Uh, even though they're a bad team, they're still a major league lineup, right? And they can still put together equitable outings from their offense. Uh, and the Twins can certainly do that because even against you know good arms, they're still an average creation offense here. Um, so it's fine to play an Alex Kirilov. Their lefties are going to be back in. Trevor Larnick is, is back up, I believe. Max Kepler will be in as well. Uh, Willie Castro, still very cheap. Like, they're going to pop in value scores for us because they're so cheap. But uh, for the most part, I really do like Bowden Francis. And uh, I think if you need to get all the way down here, like I said, I don't think we'll need to. Um, but this this puts him in play. I think he's probably got four and five innings in him. And with that kind of strikeout stuff in the upper minors, even five innings, he could strike out seven here. Or four innings, he could strike out seven. Uh, I, I think that's perfectly within range. And that could be a serviceable 18-point uh, outing or, or something like that. I think both guys, if you want to play both of these guys uh, in the same lineup, I don't think that's bad. Okay, let's move on. San Diego and Colorado. Obviously, we're only getting to offense once again here. Even though they're, you know, these two arms, 53 and 5500 for like attractive price tags. Uh, I don't want to play them. Ryan Weathers, I think, stinks. Right? He's got a 15% walk rate, or excuse me, a 15% strikeout rate and a 10% walk rate. Trouble throwing strike one at 56%. He's got a 24% chase rate and a 9% swinging strike rate. 25% CSW. No, thank you. We're not doing this in Coors Field. Uh, he's just a three-pitch guy, and the Arsenal doesn't play all that great necessarily at Coors Field because he is a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. He's a four-seamer slider guy um, against same-handed hitters. That will keep him in the air a pretty good bit, and even against opposite-handed hitters, the changeup that he throws uh, doesn't keep it down enough in the strike zone. He needs the two-seamer to throw to, to same-handed hitters to get more ground balls. Um, and he needs like a curveball or a really, really good changeup to bury it against opposite-handed hitters, keep them off the board a little bit. Um, and he just doesn't have it. So against righties this season, 330 average allowed, 406 Woba, 217 ISO, 13.5% K rate, 10% walk rate. Uh, let's do it. The hard contact is really the only figure here outside of the you know raw barrel rate. That's going to leave it on the table a little bit, but he's still giving up 1.7 homers per nine. Not overly noisy, a little bit for sure. Lower strand rate, sub 70%, that'll probably tick up for him, but for the most part, he's pitching to an 80% contact rate. He's not throwing it past anybody, so that's probably mostly where he's going to sit, hovering around 70%, and a 504.5 ish ERA, give or take. Um, Big whip though, buck fifty, and anything north of of a dollar fifty here in the whip is not a recipe for success. You want to be messing with um, at Coors Field. So let's get to the Rockies. They're going to go pretty right-handed heavy here today, I think. Uh, Brenton Doyle, Le Elias Diaz, Elaris Montero, Alan Trejo, Zeke Tovar, et cetera, et cetera, on down the list. And you can still play Ryan McMahon. Um, from the left side, he's been really seeing the baseball and hitting it very hard, as we mentioned, over the last you know couple weeks or so. Uh, so you can get to all of the Rockies. They're not going to be nearly as popular as San Diego on the other side, who get Kyle Freeland. So let's let's play some Colorado. Um, but if you want to play, if you can get to San Diego, yeah, go ahead. Now, I don't particularly enjoy shorting Kyle Freeland when he gets down to this price tag. Um he pitches to too much contact. I don't want to play him. Let's start there. He pitches to too much contact himself, just a 15% K rate as well. He also doesn't walk people, and he stays off of the barrel too. So it makes him difficult to stack against sometimes. However, it's going to be the righties here. He's giving up a hell of a lot more hard contact to them with basically identical numbers, power numbers at least, uh, that Ryan Weathers has. Um 216 ISO with a 14.5% K rate, mostly pretty similar. Far less average, 260 average for him against righties versus a 330 average for Weathers against righties. So that makes Kyle Freeland a little bit more serviceable. Um, if I had to choose, I would choose 
to stack Colorado against Weathers rather than San Diego against Kyle Freeland doesn't mean San Diego is a bad play, but they're going to be far more popular. You're going to see 20 and 30% ownership on a lot of guys. Like you saw some 40% ownership on like Tatis last night in shorter entry stuff. Um, that's probably going to be the same case today. It's a day game at Coors Field, you know, so balls should fly. And, you know, we can't really play, play any of these pitchers. But uh, offense only here. But, uh, you know, in tournaments, I just much prefer getting to Colorado because they're far less popular. Okay, Mets and the Pirates. Pirates, you needed them last night really to win any tournaments. Uh, we talked about that going after Tyler McGill. Um, you know, the Mets have been bad. You know, their offense put up some runs last night, but it was mostly off of the bullpen. Richo was fantastic. We talked about him a little bit yesterday, too, and him being in play. He went over seven innings or whatever. Like, that was excellent. Uh, not sure Yohan Oviedo is going to be able to do that today. We'll get to him in a sec. Could I sang on the mound? I'm just, I'm still not doing it, man. I, I just cannot handle a $10,000 price tag with a 14% walk rate. Once again, in his last outing, he walked five batters, and that it totally takes him out of play for me. I can't do this when you're putting 14% of the hitters you face on base for free. You elevate your own pitch count. I'm, I harp on this every day with this damn guy. Um, I don't care that the strikeout rate is this high. Now, he has a floor, and a floor in terms of strikeouts, but unfortunately, because he walks so many people, you know, if he were giving up runs and the walk rate were normal, I would be far more comfortable playing him. You know, if he had an ERA in the in the mid fours or whatever, um, and it, like I would be far more comfortable playing him. But it's the walk rate that elevates the pitch count. Um, and that prevents him from actually achieving and going deep enough into game to capitalize on the higher strikeout rate, if that makes sense. So uh, I, I, I just can't do it. Now, what is going to put me on to him, unfortunately, I'm going to be really unhappy about it, is the lower ownership. I'm only going to play this guy when he is not popular. And sub-10% ownership, yeah, I can stomach this. Uh, I'd much rather just play Sandy, and I'd much rather just play Kopech, even at their, um, you know, with their shaky metrics but he's got shaky metrics too and you know if i had to choose here give me kopech at the same ownership right almost exclusively same projection same ownership and he's 700 cheaper um you know and he's got the same strikeout rate with the same sort of underlying problems so like both of these guys are in play kopech and, and kodai sanga um yeah, but it's mostly just because of the ownership. It's not because I'm thrilled about the Arsenals uh, or, or playing the guy. He's got a break-even four-seamer, does Senga. He's got a break-even split. You know, the the entire industry has raved about this pitch. Well, it's break-even. You know, there are plenty of other guys in baseball that have a better splitter than this. So show me that you can throw this damn slider for a strike, and then maybe I'll consider playing you, and maybe I'll hop on board, but... For now, I think the price tag is just too high. There's way too much variance for me. Now, could you capitalize that on, on that in, in tournaments? Yeah, go ahead. And that's why lower ownership figure makes him very attractive with a 29% strikeout rate. Um, but he's only going to go five and five and a third innings here, and that, that really prevents me from getting excited. I need, I, I, I just need more out of that. Um, and he just hasn't shown it really all season. It's not like we're dealing with a small sample here either. He got a full 11 starts, but some guys have thrown another 20 some odd innings in their 11 starts compared to Sanga. He's only got, you know, a 60 inning sample here. So, and it's the walk rate that prevents him from going deeper into games. Um, so I'm mostly off of him, and that that's going to put me on to Pittsburgh a little bit again today. I'm much less attracted to them today than I was, you know, yesterday, of course. Um, but guys with high walk rates, they put people on base for free. So you could play stacks against them. And, yeah, go ahead. It, it, it's not super attractive, but they're still ch cheap, of course, and that makes them uh, very much playable. Really top to bottom again. Um, Brian Reynolds, 5,000 is fine. Jack Sawinski, you're going to play him again at 3,300. He had an excellent night last night. And Cabrian Hayes, he had a really, really big night last night. 4,000 for him. g Bay had a good day. Uh, Carlos Santana even hit a ball out. Um, Kutch was fine. Tuki Marcano, I think, kind of uh, shit to bed a little bit. But 
you know, for the most part, Pirates are playable once again, and this is a day game in Pittsburgh. The ballpark's going to play up a little bit of power when it's warm there. So, yeah, sure, go ahead and go after Sanga. Yoan Oviedo, we're not, I'm not going to deal with this. Uh, 7,500, number one, I don't like the price tag. Number two, I don't like the fastball. And he doesn't have a changeup to get left-handed hitters out. So I want to get to some Nimmo today. I, I think this is a good spot to play the Mets for a bounce. Um, their offense, like I said, wasn't really all that good. They got there against a the bullpen. 4,100, though, for Nimmo, I like this a, a good bit. Um, Frankie Alvarez, you can play him again. We'll see what they want to do behind the plate. you got a day game after a night game, so they might do some shenanigans, but, um, you know, with with Frankie and, and give him a day off or something. Who knows? Jeff McNeil, I think it's fine. Frankie Lindor, back up to 48. Not jacked about that, but uh, playable spot here against Yohan Oviedo. The slider value for him against right-handers, like, where's the strikeout stuff? Like, it, it was there earlier in the season. It's totally gone now. He's also got walk problems, 11% here. Um, so I'm really not interested in going after the Mets. Uh, you need guys in aggregate that can blow it by them. Now, a 23% K rate to the left side of the plate with this curveball value, that puts him in play at 7,500 if you land on it. He does have 18 and 20 in here because this offense overall is bad. Uh, they're missing their best hitter, and they're underperforming uh, over a pretty huge sample here, uh, 1,600 PAs against righties this year. They walk a good bit, but they don't create at all. The buck 50 ISO, it's average. 31% hard contact, it's average. 20% K rate, it's a little bit above average, of course. You know, but a buck 20 ground ball to fly, like they just don't create. Where's the run creation? Uh, and they don't hit the baseball over the wall. So I like some Mets, sure. Um, and I think Yohan Oviedo is in play, but I don't like this walk rate, and I need more balanced strikeout rate to get really excited about it. I'm probably not going to end up landing on it. There's some other guys I like better, but uh, I think he's in play. Okay, Dodgers, Philly. I like Bobby Miller, so if I'm going to play somebody in the 7K range, um, it's going to be him today. Uh, I, I, this is a bad matchup, and you know you get Kyle Schwarber over here that's still going to strike out a crap load, but he's really seeing the baseball now, and... You know, we're kind of into Kyle Schwarber streak territory where he starts seeing it and he, like you just got to play him every damn day. So uh, I'm going to have a couple of Phillies sort of leverage stacks and, and hedge stacks on the other side. But I really do like getting to some Bobby Miller here. Killer, killer velo. Full five pitch mix that he's using so far. Um, can't really take much out of the out of the values. Only three starts, of course, but. A good strike one rate, of course, at 64%. I really like that. I love the the control so far at 6% walk rate and a 4.5% barrel rate. Like, this is all excellent. The hard contact numbers are good so far as well, and it's translating to a 25% raw K rate. 11% swing strikes, 15% call strikes, just a 26% CSW. It's not all that great. 84% um, strand rate, probably going to see this tank. Uh, eventually. So that's why I like getting to a little bit of the Phillies over here. Kyle Schwarber is 5,200. That's m very playable. He smoked two balls last night in the triple he hit. Um, I mean, in pretty much any other ballpark outside of maybe like Boston, just because of where he hit it, and Philly, just because of where he hit it, that ball goes out. Uh, but it was an absolute missile. And same thing with the walk-off dinger that he hit. So He's 5,200. I like getting to that. Bryce Harper at 6,000. Yeah, of course. You know, you got to pay for Trey at 5,500. I mean, he's Trey, but he's been not Trey this season. Uh, JTR at 5,000. He's seen the baseball a little bit better uh, recently as well. I think that that's playable. So if I had to choose, it'd be like a Schwarber, Bryce Harper, and if I need to get cheap, it'd be a Bryce Stott or a Brandon Marsh, maybe a, a Cody Clemens at uh, 2,500 in first base. I think that's fine. You can mix in a righty as well with a JTR or a Trey or a Nick Castellanos. Any one of those pieces. I'm not going to full stack against Bobby Miller necessarily. don't think you get enough leverage there. But uh, this offense is good enough to full stack pretty much every day, uh, even though they haven't quite performed to that level that we've been expecting really all season. Just a 102 WRC plus average K rate, average hard contact rate, average power, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, Bobby Miller's very much in play at 7,000, and he's the guy in that range I'd like to get to. 10,000 on the mound for Nola. Uh, I'm just not doing this against the Dodgers. I don't trust Nola. Um, now, he hopefully he's starting to wake up a little bit, but 
Yeah, what was it, his last outing? Yeah, I mean, he got Detroit and struck out 12 in seven innings. Like, this is the Tigers, okay? And now he's got a market, literally, like, the total opposite end of the spectrum in terms of matchup here when he gets a Dodger. So I'm not doing it. Um, even at 15% ownership, I'm just going to X him out of the pool. I don't trust him. And I hope, I really hope that he makes me look like a moron. Um, but his price tag's elevated, and... I, I, I'm just not doing it. So uh, no NOLA at all for me. Um, if you've got the stones to play him against the Dodgers here with his performance so far this season um, against good teams, against bad teams outside of Detroit and, and the, like the Cubs, he took apart Houston once, right? But like, that's it. Every other start for him has been 20 points or less on DK. So no thank you. And we got a huge sample on him, 13 starts this season. And he's had three equitable outings, so I, I'm just not doing it. Um, that means we can get to the Dodgers, but do you really want to go after Aaron Nola here, who is still a serviceable arm, don't get me wrong, with a 6,000 Freddie Freeman, a 5K Max Muncy. I like that price a little bit. Um, 6,200 Mookie and 5,700 Will Smith, 53 for JD. Like, yikes. Hard to get there with the Dodgers in terms of um, – yeah, yeah, these price tags, but like even given these price tags, they're still only middling in value scores here. So uh, I think that suggests that, you know, Nola could very much get blown apart. Um, we're looking for some positive regression for Nola because he's been bad. But where's the whiff stuff above average? The 28 percent K rate that we've seen from Nola in the past, it's not there. So similar to like a Sandy Alcantara, he may be struggling a little bit with the baseball change this season. So I'm not doing it. Um, and I very rarely, now that the Dodgers offense is really heating up and gotten into the swing of things here in the season, so to speak, um, I'm rarely going to be playing pitchers against them probably for the rest of the year. So give me offense, um, a little bit of the Phillies, Dodgers mostly, but a good bit of Bobby Miller too. Okay. Kansas city and the Orioles, uh, Brady Singer on the mound. He's been better. Okay. in his, in his last several starts, but he's also been a total disaster zone. Uh, for the most part of the, this year. Uh, five and two-thirds in his last outing, seven strikeouts, and no production uh, against him against Colorado. However, that is Colorado. This is Baltimore, and they are a markedly better team. Um, even though they don't create all that much above average, they still create about a 10 ticks better than Colorado does against right-handed pitching. Similar strikeout rate. You know, 22 at 23 percent average, right? 32 percent hard contact rate. Buck 65, sneaky higher ISO here for the O's. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. Um, you know, they're an attackable offense with guys that have really, really good stuff. And Brady Singer, I don't think he has really, really good stuff. So um, I'm going to leave him on the shelf today at 5,800. I wouldn't be surprised if he pops here. Maybe the last couple outings have given him a bit more confidence in his stuff against Washington and Colorado though. But you know, the outing before that against Detroit, he got blown apart and gave up five and three and two thirds. So um, I still think we got a little bit of time yet to see Brady Singer uh, really figure this out. He's mainlining a two seamer here and he doesn't throw a change up all that often. So he's a bad pitch against left-handers and without a good equitable change up, like you're just going to get torched. So give me some Baltimore again. I know they kind of disappointed last night, but I think they're very much in play once again. Frazier at the top of the lineup. I like this as a second base play at 3,600 today. Rutch from the left side today at 54. I think that's playable also. Santander, he'll switch hit. Like him a little bit more from the right side, but whatever. 4,400 playable price tag. You can play Aaron Hicks if you want. You can play Gunner at 3,600 too. So uh, give me some Baltimore. They're going to be down the list a little bit in ownership, and I think that makes him a very good tournament play. Um, you know, these guys are still going to get on. They're still going to try and create and, and steal some bases, even though they're missing Cedric. So, uh, give me some O's here and probably no Brady Singer. I don't think I'm going to need to get down there. Cole Irvin on the mound for the O's. He's back. Um, and he's got just three starts because he's been really hurt all season. And it, 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 it's kind of enigmatic here for Cole Irvin. Um, He's got a very low strike one rate so far this year. This has never been this low. He's always been a good strike thrower. In Oakland, he was giving up a lot of hard contact. Um, but he's had some serviceable... He had 
a lot of serviceable outings last season, to be quite honest. And he took apart some really good offenses, Houston and Texas, several times. Um, he went after the Angels. They were not all that great last season. But, you know, these numbers, we can't really take a lot out of them because he was, you know, dealing with, with injury. Um, and, and, they, and they optioned him, you know, down, down to uh, AAA to really kind of get him right because, like, they – they saw what was coming here. He was walking too many people. He couldn't throw strike one, um, and you know they had to kind of kind of get him right. So, um, sixty two hundred, he's back, and I think this is an okay and, and playable price tag for him. I really don't like number one that he's left handed, and and the Royals they make a lot of hard contact still against left handers. Um, and look at this, 92 WRC plus against lefties this year. Even though this is a bad team against righties, and they're 18 and 45 for God's sake, uh, they're still very sneaky and dangerous against left-handed pitching. So we'll see. I think Cole Irvin is in play at 6200. I'm looking for a bounce. He's been, um, you know, good enough in in AAA and while he's been down and and you know getting healthier and and sorting out the shenanigans from early in the season. Um, can't really expect all this to be to really continue for Cole. Uh, he's been a very serviceable arm for a, a good while here. So do um, you want to go after him with some Royals? Yeah, sure. They got good numbers against lefties. And, um, you know, Cole Irvin has historically still pitched to a lot of contact and been attackable with opposite-handed hitters. You know, but he's got a full five-pitch mix and a pretty decent changeup historically. Uh, so I'm not really jacked about playing some super expensive Bobby Witt still at 5,700, Salvi at 55, Eddie Olivares is fine at 26. He makes those guys more attainable. Freddie Fermin at uh, 2,800, they brought him up and you know probably in a day game maybe give Salvi a day, uh, you know a day off or something like that. Um, you know they might be leading off. A, another young kid, Michael Garcia, who they recently called up. So there's there's cheap and playable pieces from the right side here, which kind of takes me off of Irvin a little bit. I want to see what he's going to perform like for the most part at um, at this level. So that's probably going to keep me off. And once again, I don't think I'm, I'm going to need to get all the way down here. I'd rather just play like Bobby Irvin, uh, or Bobby Miller rather, than Cole Irvin. That's kind of where I stand on this game. Uh, offense, for sure, from from the Orioles. Maybe a little bit of the Royals, too, just as some coverage. But um, kind of lukewarm on it for the most part. And hopefully that doesn't uh, really burn me. Okay, let's get to Washington and Atlanta. Mackenzie Gore on the mound, 8,900. Ugh. Um, you know, it, it, his strikeout stuff this season, it, 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 it's total breakout territory here, right? 29% K rate. I really, really like this. Um, the walk rate, he's leaving it on the table there. Strike one rate's okay. You know, we need this above 60% to be, you know, really comfortable with it. Chase rate's fine, 31%. Swinging strikes and, and called strikes. You know, we, we need more called strikes out of him to push the CSW up above 30. Strand rate's high here, so we're looking for maybe a little bit of a down tick there. It's really the walk rate that's plagued him a little bit. He's on the barrel still a little bit. Um, but he's breaking out this season. We've mentioned this a couple of times. Look at these hard contact numbers against lefties. Sample is, is still very small, but he's getting picked apart here a little bit. Um, so I think that makes him kind of attackable with a couple of these left-handed bats, but I'm not going out of my way to play Matt Olson, 5,800 in this spot. Um, you know, they'll, they'll probably platoon Eddie Rosario. Michael Harris probably be in there, but, uh, you know, they're going to go right-handed heavy here and... You know, I think that kind of keeps him in play at super, super low ownership. He's got very good strikeout stuff and good suppression metrics, high soft contact rate against right-handers with a 29% hard contact rate. I think this is very equitable with a buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. This is a super dangerous matchup, of course, against Atlanta. Um, but we saw what JoJo Gray did to them last night. Like, this this offense, they don't create against right-handed pitching. They're much more dangerous against lefties, of course. Um, because of all the righties they have. But they just don't create against right-handed pitching. That That's really what happened last night. And JoJo, even though he doesn't strike anybody out, he survived because they can't create runs when they're not hitting the baseball over the wall. And Mackenzie Gore has enough in the tank here to throw it past them and keep them from hitting it out of the yard. So I think it puts him in play at super low ownership. But don't get me wrong, I gulp at this walk rate 
because you put one guy on or two guys on base with a uh, you know a walk a bloop and then Austin Riley hits a a dinger, it, like you're all of a sudden just totally dead in the water. So um, it's a really gulpy play here at 8900. But I think he's in play, and I think he has 22 and 25 in the tank um, because I think he might be able to get a little bit of run support here. Jared Schuster he pitches too much contact for me. He does. He has a 16% strikeout rate with a 15% walk rate. Like, what are we doing here? Um, six full starts for him in the bigs this season. I'm not touching him at 6,200 against the Nats. I don't think he's going to be able to strike anybody out. So give me some offense here from Washington. I think it's a sneaky spot. They're still very cheap. They're not popping as high as they normally do. Um, but 114 WRC plus with a 292 average against lefty. That's a huge number. They don't hit for any power of course and very little hard contact but a, a solid line drive rate pushing 23 percent neutral ground ball to fly ball otherwise so they're going to get it in the air a little bit and on a line i think that's very playable um even though joey Manessas his power is totally gone this year he's still 3600 i like this play jamer you can play stone garrett i really like at 3000 flat so probably you know the lane thomas sure he's shown a lot of good numbers against left-handers this season as has alex call um, you want to play an Ildi Vargas behind, you know, down at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, he's got dual eligibility. Play that in a wraparound stack or something. He'll hit from the right side too. So you could get to some right-handed pieces. Probably short stacks, I think, would be my favorite. Um, you know, Lane Thomas, Joey Manessa, Stone Garrett type. Uh, but you could play a Jamer, throw him in there. You could play a Kbert as well, even though he doesn't have a lot of power. Also a day game in warm Atlanta, 90 degrees down there, and... You know, the ballpark's going to play a power. It's a hitter's ballpark anyway. So, uh, I like some Washington. I'm less on the Braves, and I think it's a, a decent ownership pivot. I'll still have some Atlanta, of course, because they're getting a lefty here, and I'm going to have some coverage against the, my very likely Gore exposure here. But you don't need to get a lot of Mackenzie Gore to get super over the field. Um, you know, you can get 10% Gore, and you got 2.5x the field there. I think that's leverage, and... Um, 10% of your teams is still plenty to, you know, if you land on the right combination. So um, I think that puts him in play, and I like the Nationals in some correlated team, maybe like a short correlated stack, you know, Gore and a three-man or something like that. I think that's okay. Um, but, you know, Atlanta okay too, for sure, you know, as some, some coverage plays. Uh, no Jared Schuster for me pitches to too much contact. Okay, Texas and Tampa, uh, two really good offenses here, two pretty good arms as well. Um, I don't want to play Nathan Diavaldi here, 11,000. I think he's too expensive in this particular matchup. So if he burns me again, um, I'm just going to have to live with it. And he's, he's got to show me that he can continuously do this against all of the best lineups in baseball. Um, I'm not quite convinced that, that, that he really can. Um, the Yankees... When they were missing a lot of their guys is where he really started his run here and striking out everybody. Um, you know, the, the Yankees still strike out, and they're very attackable with right-handed pitching. Same with the Angels. They're very attackable with good right-handed pitching. Then he got Oakland after that and went eight and two-thirds. That was kind of the, the run he was on. Um, you know, Oakland is Oakland. He struck out 12 in that game. Then he got Atlanta shortly after that, and it wasn't near as equitable. Still went seven innings, struck out five. But Atlanta strikes out. Average team against right-handed pitching. Then he got Pittsburgh. Then he got Detroit. And then he got Seattle. So he's had some very good matchups here. Um, and Tampa is not one of those. So he's seeing 20% ownership right now. And despite Tampa being very... You know, very low in the value score. It's because they're expensive. I think getting to some Tampa leverage stacks here against Nathan Eovaldi um, is still pretty warranted. Earlier in the season, he was giving up a lot of hard contact. He's really gotten that under control. But like I said, his last six starts, um, seven starts, he's had very good matchups against subpar teams and and below average teams and above average teams in in terms of the strikeout um, strikeouts. So. I'm not I'm not paying for him at, at eleven thousand. Think he's too expensive. I don't play pitchers against Tampa anyway, um, unless they've just got elite elite stuff. And I I don't think Nathan Eovaldi really does. He's got a very good split. Don't get me wrong, and a good four seamer with the good cutter. So he's got a good three pitch mix here. But I think he needs more swing and miss. 
uh, with the slider. Even though he's throwing the split and getting a lot of really good value out of it, um, I'm concerned that going after Tampa here, you know, this is the first real good offense outside of the Atlanta start that, that he's seen. And Atlanta got to him a little bit. You know, he went seven innings, but he still gave up three runs and only struck out five. So I think that could be very well within range here in a similar type of outing against Tampa because it's the second, I'd, I'd call them the second best offense in baseball um, right there with the Dodgers, but it's like one in one A. So, um, you know, one, the one B really might be Texas on the other side. So I don't want to deal with um, Nathan Eovaldi here against Tampa, and I don't really want to deal with Taj Bradley either at 9,300. I know I know the strikeout stuff has been there for him as well, but um, you know, they, and it keeps both of these guys in play. Don't get me wrong. I'd prefer Taj Bradley here, but I think I'd almost want to play Michael Kopech instead. Um, you now, I know the, the numbers for Taj here are excellent. Uh, and that's going to keep him very much in play. But the hard contact numbers are super worrisome, and he's a fly ball pitcher. So I don't really want to deal with this. He's given up a lot of hard contact, even though he's got good value on the cutter here. Like, to the left, he's 36% hard and a 21% um, soft. It, you know, that's really encouraging. So it's really kind of enigmatic here for Taj Bradley. Um, that puts him in play in tournaments. I'd rather play him than, than Eovaldi for sure at the same ownership. Because he's 1700 cheaper. Um, so if I'm getting it, you know, in the 9K range, Kopeck and, 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 yeah, sure, some Sandy and some Taj, I think, you know, those are the three guys, of course. Um, and I probably just prefer Taj, I think, given the, the raw upside. But, man, I do not want to go after Texas. I really love this lineup over here. Uh, they are insanely dangerous. I know the game's in Tampa. So, excuse me, that's probably going to put me on to them a little bit more um, or it put me onto the pitching a little bit more here in this game and, and less so the offense. But uh, I think both offenses are playable because you need to have exposure to probably four teams whenever they're on the slate pretty much every day. And that's Tampa, that's Texas, that's Atlanta, and that's the Dodgers. And it, it's every single day, no matter who they're playing. Um, they're the four best offenses in baseball, four most potent offenses in baseball. So, uh, I'm kind of lukewarm on this. Um, you know, of any of the teams that we talked about so far and in pitching that we talked about so far, considering the matchups, et cetera, et cetera, I think I'm mostly on Taz Bradley uh, at 93 going against a, a really, really tough offense over here. But, yeah, I mean, I'm not super thrilled about it, despite a very attractive K stuff. Um, if he's going to give up some production, he's got the floor to – you know, in terms of strikeouts to eke that back. But what I'm really worried about with Taj here is depth. Um, just five innings to start here and only 85 pitches. So uh, it's it, it kind of takes me off a little bit. I'm going to have to do a little bit more digging and see if I really want to click in Taj here. Um, super, super worrisome matchups here. So uh, that's kind of where I stand on this game. Um, not really a strong take either way outside of fading Eovaldi. Okay, last game here, Oakland and Milwaukee. I'm going to go right back to Oakland. Um, and it, it's not going to be with Paul Blackburn, I'll tell you that much. Uh, he was okay, I think, in, in his last start. Um, in my, Yeah, against Miami. He went five innings. I mean, he gave up five earned runs, so that's not okay. It was, it was really the depth. Um, the start before that against Atlanta, that was the one I was remembering where he struck out six in just four innings. So, um not so good against Miami, pretty serviceable against against Atlanta. I think Milwaukee is very much attackable. Once again, we saw what Luis Medina coming out of the bullpen did to them last night. He was great. And Milwaukee, not so much. So um, now do I want to play Blackburn here? It, historically, no. Like He's given up a lot of contact to the left side. He's had walk problems. He's had barrel problems himself. Pretty much like every Oakland pitcher is the exact same guy. Um, however... He's got far more in the in the arsenal, in the quiver here, uh, to work with. So do I really want to stack Milwaukee against him? Probably not. I, like, I don't like this offense, man. I don't think they're very good. Um, and they're similar to, like, uh, Minnesota, right? They are an average creation. They strike out more, but 
they are kind of on the downside of average and less like Arizona, for example, um, where they're kind of on the upside of average. When they get a good matchup, you could play Arizona. When Milwaukee gets a good matchup, you're still kind of like throwing up in your mouth a little bit, be like, man, do I really have to play Milwaukee? Um, so that's kind of where I stand with them. Like, I don't like the price tag. They did get Willie Adamas back. He's at a very playable 4,200. I like that as a shortstop play. And I'm still going to be playing Owen Miller. He's really the only one getting on base. Um, but Rowdy at 47, I'm not too jacked about. Christian Yelich, 48, he's cooled off significantly. Not too jacked about. Um, it's it just kind of eh. And John Singleton they brought up. Um, been around for a long, long time. He's cheap at, at first base if you want to come off of the Rowdy. You can play him at, at 2,200. That's fine. Joey Weimer has been very hot recently, seeing the baseball very well. 2,400, he's fine too. Probably see, um, you know, Vic Caratini in the in the list today, as opposed to a Willie Contreras behind the plate. Um, he he'll, he'll hit from the left side. That's fine. But if you want to stack some Milwaukee, yeah, it's okay. But they're going to be kind of popular here, and I'm not really all that interested in it, to be quite honest. So um, give me Oakland here going after Julio Tehran, even though he's actually been, you know, kind of serviceable. Um, I don't like this price tag. Like, what are we doing with 8,700 Julio Tehran? Um, but he's gone five innings, six innings, six and a third in each of his three starts here. Struck out five against San Francisco. Didn't strike out anybody against Toronto. Uh, but he went so deep and didn't give, give up any runs. Got a win out of it that he still eked, eked out 15 DK points, which is pretty damn serviceable. Six and a third, as I mentioned, against six, Cincinnati. Gave up two runs, but struck out five there and was still serviceable at 16 DK points. So that puts him in play against Oakland because, like, I'm in play against Oakland. Um, however, 8,100 or 8,700, I'm not too sure about that. I'm really looking for Julio Tehran to regress a good bit. Um you know, the, the strikeout number here at 15%, it's noisy, right? Because he had that zero strikeout outing with uh, Toronto. Um, kind of sandwiched in between his K and inning strikeout games. So he's throwing a lot of strike one, which is really, really good. And the walks have been very much under the control here. So um, I still want to get to a little bit of Oakland. They're popping super hard in value score once again. And... I think if you need to get to a very expensive offense, again, like a um, a San Diego in Coors Field or the Dodgers or St. Louis, something like that, uh, this is, you know, Oakland can make that happen. Um, they had plenty of opportunities last night, and they really underperformed. They had a lot of guys kind of shit the bed, notably Ryan Noda, Seth Brown, Jace Peterson, um from the left side of the plate against Adrian Hauser. They had a lot of opportunities to drive in a lot of runs there. Really, the best performance from them, best two, were Asteri Ruiz and Ramon Laureano. Um, but all of them are still playable because they're all under 3,000 outside of Ruiz, who is 3,400. So, um, you know, Ruiz got 30 bags already this season. He's going to steal 70 bags probably this year. So, uh, yeah, give me back, give me some more Oakland again going after Tehran, um, but if you want to play him, he's only 3% owned, and he gets Oakland, and like I said, he's gone deep enough into games here, and he's efficient early in the count, so, um, you know, the strand rate at 91%, like, this is going to come down, right, so, uh, this is why I think Oakland is in play, in addition to their price tags, but Julio Tehran, given the very efficient strike one early count numbers here, uh, is very much in play too, but he's mainlining a sinker, and we get still, and we got to be careful with that. Historically, he's always had problems with left-handed hitters, so um, you know they're gonna have a lot of lefties. I'm gonna have Noda, I'm gonna have Seth Brown, I'm gonna have some Jace once again with some Mysterio Ruiz and a very cheap remote Laureano. Been seeing the baseball very well recently. Um, so yeah, give me Oakland, give me a little bit of the Brewers. I mean, I guess going after Blackburn, but uh, eh, kind of lukewarm on Milwaukee once again if you want to go take um you know a, a three to two punt on Oakland in the betting markets don't think this is a terrible play to be quite honest uh okay so we're about an hour once again let's uh quickly go over a review Arizona Detroit kind of lukewarm on the game not super excited about pitching if anything it'd be Matt Boyd because he's a better arm um and if any offense it'd be Arizona because they're a better offense but uh overall just kind of meh um but I do like some right-handed pieces here Lourdes and um, a Christian Walker, for example. 
Uh, Miami and the White Sox uh, pitching to – but if you want to go after these guys with these offenses, I mean, they're struggling. There's some real worrisome underlying metrics here for both Kopech and Sandy Alcantara. A bad changeup for Sandy here that he can't really figure out. Strikeout stuff down three ticks below average now. And Kopech, he's got a high barrel rate, very high barrel rate, and a high walk rate too. So, yeah, go ahead. They're expensive price tags, and getting some ownership is Sandy. So I'm not super thrilled about playing that. I'd rather pivot that ownership to Kopech. And that ownership, I'd probably rather rather pivot to Taj Bradley. Um, since he's in St. Louis, give me Cincinnati again. I'm going to go after Michaelis because Michaelis also getting north of 20% ownership. I think he's a fine arm, but he pitches to too much contact here. And I really like Ellie De La Cruz, so I'm going to play him again. Um, St. Louis for sure because we can go after Andrew Abbott also. Uh, Minnesota, Toronto. Um <sighs> I like Bowden Francis a little bit here. If you need to get all the way down to 5,000, I think he's very much in play going after Minnesota. I think their offense stinks. Um, but if you want to stack some of their really high upside lefties, Trevor Larnuk, um and uh, Alex Kirilov, uh, guys like this, Max Kepler from the left side of the plate, that's fine. Uh, you can always, of course, play Carlos Correa pretty much against anybody. He's starting to see the baseball a little bit better, so keep an eye on him. He's very playable, 4,400 here. Uh, Toronto on the other side against Orion, no thanks, really. Um, if I'm getting above 10K, like he's the arm I'm going to play. San Diego, Colorado, offense only. And I like Colorado in tournaments better than I like San Diego, mostly because of the ownership delta. Uh, but that doesn't mean San Diego's bad by any means, of course. Mets, Pittsburgh. Um, give me a little bit of the Mets, I think, against Oviedo, but I think Oviedo is in play, 7,500. Um, not super thrilled about it because the Mets still don't strike out, but they're a bad offense, man. Uh, no Kodai Senga for me. I'm just not doing it with the high walk rate, and that means I'm probably going to have some Pittsburgh again. I'm definitely going to have some Jackson Winsky and some, some Brian Reynolds at playable price tags, um, and maybe a little bit of cuts, too. Dodgers, Philly, I really like the Dodgers here. I'm going to go after Aaron Nola. Um, I don't trust him. 12 strikeouts against the Tigers is uh, not impressive, to say the least. Bobby Miller, I really like on the mound as well. In the 7K range, he's the guy I'd prefer to play, even though I'm going to have some Philly on the other side to coverage, uh, as some coverage um, to cover that you know ownership I have on Bobby Miller. Schwarber, 5,200, I like that, that spot for him. Um, Casey in Baltimore, no Brady Singer. I'm, I'm still in kind of wait and see mode. Cole Irvin back up and back healthy, hopefully. Um, I think he's in play if you need to get down there at 6,200, but I would much rather play the wait and see game with both of these pitchers here and get to some some Baltimore stacks um, and targeting Brady, Brady Singer here. Although I, I think he might be turning the corner a little bit. Kind of takes me off of Baltimore. Washington, definitely. Uh, I want to go after Jared Schuster. He pitches to too much contact as like a 16% K rate and Washington doesn't strike out at all. They have a huge, huge average batting average uh, against lefties. So yeah, sign me up. Um, I think you can see some offense from them today. Atlanta, definitely. Yeah. You can go after McKenzie Gore, but I think Gore is also very much in play. Uh, really good tournament play here. It's super low ownership compared to Bradley Kopech and Sandy Alcantara in the nine K range, Texas, Tampa. I like offense here. Um, you know, you kind of have to like the pitching because it's two really good arms. But, like, I got to side with Tampa here against Diavaldi. I don't like his price tag, so that's why I'm not going to be playing him. Um, Taj I like, but, man, I, I really like Texas, too. I am I think they're you know, a very close third to the Dodgers and Tampa in terms of offensive efficiency. Um, super dangerous spot here. So kind of an elevated price tag, to be honest with Taj, even though I like him a little bit. Kind of tilting me on to, as I talk through it, uh, a little bit more Mackenzie Gore. Oakland and Milwaukee. Oakland, definitely. If I need to get very expensive with, like, a Gore and a Bradley team or something like that, um, then give me some Oakland going after Julio Tehran. I do think Julio Tehran is also in play at very low ownership. I, I, I like that play, and I'll probably have a little bit because Oakland is still bad, man. Um, even though they're super cheap and you don't like, you, you know, you want to play some of these guys. Uh, 3% ownership for a right-hander against Oakland is you know, kind of a free free money play for the most part. Uh, so, okay, that's it. Um, went a little bit long once again. 11-game slate here, uh, so enjoy the day baseball, everybody. We're not going to have um, any content, or at least I won't, for the main. We will have projections and stuff up uh, for the short little three-game 
main slate, I think, or uh, night slate, I think they're calling it here on DK. We will have projections for the six-game afternoon slate, though. So keep an eye out for pushes as we get closer here to lock. Good luck, everybody.